Good morning. My name is April Barber Scales, and I will be the moderator for Clemency and Beyond. A welcome to our third annual Vigil for Freedom and Racial Justice, and the final Vigil Community Conversations on Clemency and Beyond. As part of the Vigil, the North Carolina Justice Center has hosted a series of community conversations featuring North Carolina-based advocates fighting for freedom and racial justice in our state and educating their community on the ongoing harms of the modern day carceral system. Let me give you a little information about the vigil. The Vigil for Freedom and Racial Justice is made up of a broad coalition of North Carolinians calling for justice, fairness and second chances for people incarcerated in our state, especially black people and people of color. The campaign is in its third year and over the course of this month, people have gathered for a vigil every day outside the governor's executive clemency mansion. The primary power, uh, the, the primary demand of the vigil is that Governor Cooper exercises his clemency power. And just last week, the governor granted clemency for 10 people. We recognize this step is in the right direction and also recognize that the work is not yet done. We hope today's conversations will provide even more insight about the importance of clemency and other efforts to help loved ones to return from incarceration. Let's talk about the importance of having some clemency conversations and beyond. And I will be introducing various speakers, such as Grandma Hardy and her Free Her campaign. Uh, good morning. My name is Phyllis Grandma Hardy. I am the matriarch for the National Council. Uh, I am a member and I'm also the in-reach outreach advocate. Uh, and what that is, is that I reach inside the prisons. I find out what the women and the men need. I try to take care of it. If they are trying to come home, I find uh, uh, different things that they, resources in the different states that they're going to be released to. Um, I also, we do a free her campaign and it's composed of three elements. One is policy. And one of the policies is the caretaker's bill, whereby when someone's arrested, they automatically come under the caretaker. And the caretaker is a person that gets arrested and is able to go home to their family and take care of their own children. Then they go to court. And by the time they go to court, they're working, they have uh, upgraded their situations, and hopefully they ended up, end up getting probation so they can be home with their children because then the kids don't get into the state system. And this is what's needed in our communities. The other one is we do issue campaigns. Any issues that states are having, the federal system uh, is having with uh, the, in the federal way, um, we fight for these issues. We march, we petition, we do whatever is necessary to get it changed and to make it better. And the third thing in our system is reimagining communities. We go into a community and replace people in there that's door knockers, find out what your community needs. And in turn, we try to help our communities get better. We have freight, freight farms that we put in communities where vegetables are grown so that people can have fresh vegetables people that can't afford to go buy vegetables. There's so many things. We also work on clemencies. We have a clemency quilt for each state in the United States with names of people that want clemency. And we're fighting for those women. And we fight for the men because anything, any laws that are changed through our endeavorment will affect the men also. So just because we are the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, that does not mean that we don't think of the men because we need the men to support what we do. 
So we have to think of them too. I'm also in the state of North Carolina, which is my own state. And I am part of the new reentry council. We have an office when people are released, they go to that office. And since we represent three counties at our organization, we're able to house these people, feed these people and take care of them at least for the first three months, help them find jobs. But that doesn't mean that we cannot reach out to all of the rest of the 97 counties in North Carolina to find resources for people that come home. And this is one of the other things that I do. And I enjoy what I do. The only way change can come about is that we all do it together. So there's a lot of things involved in clemency. Clemency is a form of cutting someone's time, giving them release to go home, go to a halfway house, or go to home confinement until their prison sentence is over. But that does not stop them from working. It does not stop them from enjoying the time with their families. This is what we're about, freeing our people. Because the main thing is the taxpayers are suffering because of the high expense that incarceration causes. It cuts what's needed in our communities because our taxes go to prisons. But nowadays the prisons are not doing what they're supposed to. They're not feeding them right. They're not giving them medical care. They're dying in prison. I had a lady, she was due to go home in January. She'd been sick for a whole year. She died in December. I also have a lady, she's 84. She needs a heart transplant. Her family has offered to pay for it. The BOP won't let them, but they won't let her go to her family and let her family take care of it. So she's back and forth to the emergency room. The taxpayers are paying for that. That's another reason that clemency is important. I would also like to introduce Ms. Danielle Mitz from the Free Her Campaign and the National Council. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Danielle Mitz. I'm here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm director of clemency for the National Council for Incarcerated for Form and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Um, we started a free heart campaign. And like Grandma Hardy said, is we have three buckets of policy, three buckets that we operate from, and that is policy, litigation, and reimagining communities. Um, I am a recipient of clemency myself. At the age of 26, I was sentenced to three life sentences plus 20 years. And um, I was in the federal prison. I was the last woman that President Obama granted clemency to. And uh, if I didn't get clemency, I would have died in prison. So because in federal prison, life means life. There is no parole. Uh, nothing could happen once you get life, once you file all your papers and everything and um, exhaust all your appeals. Clemency is the only thing that you can really fight for. So I'm thankful and grateful that I'm here on this call this morning because um, if it wasn't for people like the National Council uh, coming together with can do clemency, I would still be sitting in prison. So we started the campaign, the Free Heart Campaign in the six New England states because that's the least incarceration, least amount of incarceration for women in the world. So we're starting in Maine, Rhode Island, Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. And so uh, we start in there to raise the drumbeat so we can spread that across the world, the importance of clemency and um, how important that is. We don't want clemency to be treated as a lottery, like you have to get a special number. Right now, presently, they have over 18,000 petitions pending in the Department of Justice. So everybody who filed for clemency, they're just waiting to see what's gonna happen next. We don't have nothing active. There's nothing for the women to find out about if, you know, what's their status on their clemency or nothing. They're just sitting there from the last administration. So uh, what we do at the National Council, we get behind people cases. We cannot file clemency for them, but we get behind the cases that uh, reach out to us 
and try to raise awareness about what we can do. This past year, we had a, quite a few victories. We had a woman serving 60 years in federal prison. Name is Pamela Tyler. She was fortunate enough to get out. We had another Miss Angela Jefferson. She was she served 30 something years in prison and she was fortunate enough to get out, but we have a lot of work to do. And um, we just ask that you all be a part of this work. And um, we just need you all to join this, join this fight just nationwide because we really people are just sitting there. And um, um, we also have an international convening where we deal with women across the nation as well, like in Ghana, Zimbabwe, uh, Cuba, New Zealand, cross country. So this is a big movement that we're doing and we just want people to be involved and see what we can do, how we can connect to make this happen for those that we left behind. Because um, this is a sad time for me this time of year, knowing that I have women that I left that really are dependent on us to be their voices because they don't get to speak out about these things. And as Grandma and Hardy say, they got a lot of people in prison. They have a lot of illnesses. And those are women that came in as young as 26 and now and they're like senior citizens with illnesses. And um, it, it's, just, it's just awful the way the system treat the people. You know, I, I don't believe that anyone should, could think that you can send someone to prison and they can heal from being incarcerated. That, that's not so. There's more trauma inflicted on you once you get there. Um, I'm, I've been home for almost six years now, but I, I still haven't stopped. My trauma is still ongoing, ongoing just because of what I had to be faced with while I was incarcerated. But I'm here now to join the fight and fight for my sisters and give them hope that, hey, if it could happen for me, it could happen for you. But we need all of you all to be on board, everybody. And that's about it. Thank you so much. I also want to add that the National Council has a community love fund that, all, that actually begins while incarcerated. They give you money, free money for you to establish yourself, and it begins while you're incarcerated and carries on for the first year um, to help you get started in life. And without that, a lot of people would not have been able to have a fresh start, whether you've been locked up 20 years, 30 years or 10 years, if you're just starting fresh with nothing, then without anything, it's almost impossible to start without almost reverting back to what got you where you were to begin with. So um, let me introduce now, Mr. Jamie Lau. He's gonna talk about insights on the process of clemency in North Carolina. Thank, thank you, April. Um, and also thank you to everyone who organizes the visual uh, on an annual basis. This is the third year uh, of the visual, and before the the, the first visual, uh, Governor Cooper had not uh, utilized his clemency power uh, at all during his first term of his administration. Uh, and during that first visual in December, uh, five people received pardons of innocence uh, from the governor. Uh, and I think the timing of that was directly directly related to the people. Uh, camping outside of his home or, or having a presence outside of his home in Raleigh uh, and being that visible reminder every day of the power he has. Um, I want to spend some time talking about uh, clemency in North Carolina, uh, but right before I do that, I just want to mention uh, Danielle raises this incredible, the important point about the people who are wasting away in federal prisons who are deserving of a second chance. Uh, I came to clemency and doing a work in the clemency space um, here in North Carolina, in part because uh, students worked with me during President Obama's administration when he was calling for those commutation applications to put together petitions on behalf of uh, people who are incarcerated in federal prisons. Uh, and those people we helped at that time uh, who received commutation from President Obama are thriving and doing amazing things, uh, similar to Danielle uh, today, and are just really proof of the power of taking the human power that is locked away in prisons um, and deploying that into our communities and the positive gains that occur as a result of that. Uh, the, the, the people that we helped who were incarcerated in federal prisons are, are doing wonderful things today, and there's so much capacity lost by people keeping people locked away um 
well beyond any meaningful period of time, um, other than just for pure punitive uh, reasons. Um, here in North Carolina, uh, and one more thing on federal before I move to North Carolina, uh, the Biden administration has been atrocious with respect to uh, utilizing its clemency power, um, and similar pressure needs to be raised on that administration to take steps um, to reduce the federal prison population uh, and, and to, you know, return those uh, people incarcerated back to their families, their communities, and let them do the amazing things that Danielle and others who receive commutations under President Obama are presently doing. On to North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina currently has about 30,000 people locked away in its state prisons. Uh, another 70,000 people uh, are under some form of supervision. So approximately 100,000, uh, more than 100,000 people um, are subject to restraints from the government. Um, and, and many of them, you know, unnecessarily so today. Uh, people are incarcerated for a variety of reasons, uh, but, you know, people who are incarcerated uh, are, are demonstrating every day uh, their rehabilitation, uh, their readiness to return to society and make a positive impact on those communities. And of course, they can't do that while they're uh, incarcerated. Uh, the visual has been putting pressure on the governor uh, because the governor has the power um, to make that change, uh, to create, to, to decarcerate North Carolina in a way that is safe uh, and helps uh, North Carolina grow in a positive way. Uh, Article 3, Section 5-6 of the North Carolina Constitution uh, provides the governor the power to grant pardons, commutations, or reprieves. Uh, the only limitation on the governor's power to do that is that the General Assembly can create laws uh, with regard to the form of the application for a pardon. Uh, the only way that the governor's power is limited is by what rules the General Assembly creates for a pardon application. Um, pardon and commutations have different meanings. Uh, so with regards to a commutation, the governor's power is absolute. Uh, the General Assembly can't limit it in any way. They can't even tell him what an application must look like for a commutation uh, because the Constitution is very specific that that is only um, available to the legislature for a pardon application. Uh, so the governor tomorrow could grant uh, clemency in a broad way. Um, there's organizations, ACLU, North Carolina, among them, many at the visual, uh, who are, are seeking categorical clemency. Uh, people who have been charged or incarcerated on the basis of a possession of a controlled substance could all receive a commutation tomorrow with the stroke of the governor's pen uh, and walk out of prison uh, doors. So the governor's power is very uh, well established and he has the ability to do amazing and transformative things um, through clemency. Uh, a commutation, of course, is a reduction in the sentence. So a person is incarcerated or they're on supervision, the governor can reduce that, uh, eliminate the supervision, uh, let somebody go free under time served, and set conditions if wanted if people are leaving. Um, April uh, knows this all too well, uh, but April received a sentence commutation, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, April, back in March, I believe, was, was when the commutation um, occurred. And the governor set limitations or, or restrictions, and April will be supervised for three years, but I imagine she's more than happy uh, to uphold those conditions uh, in exchange for her freedom. Uh, so the governor can set conditions to ensure um, that the people who are receiving a commutation or a lesser sentence uh, continue to thrive even while outside. Uh, so that's a commutation where somebody's incarcerated under supervision and the sentence is reduced uh, by an act of the governor. Uh, and then there's pardons. Uh, in North Carolina, we have two types of pardons. We have a pardon of innocence uh, and a pardon of forgiveness. Uh, a pardon of innocence uh, is often granted after a court vacates somebody can conviction, uh, which is kind of odd and uh, unusual because it's a pardon which connotes forgiveness or mercy being given to someone a court has already said shouldn't have been convicted in the first place. Uh, but the biggest import of a pardon of innocence is it entitles somebody 
um, who has served time in prison later had their conviction uh, reversed, uh, having the opportunity for compensation from the state, which is uh, very inadequate. The maximum compensation anybody can obtain as a result of wrongful incarceration in North Carolina is $750,000. Uh, and someone like uh, our, our office's former client, Ronnie Long, who served more than 43 years in prison, uh, for those 43 years of time he lost from his life, uh, could only receive the maximum amount of 750000 uh, from the state. But that's the key component of the pardon of innocence, is it's that triggering of a, a, a government or, or a state acknowledgement of somebody's innocence and wrongful incarceration and compensation. Uh, and then there's a pardon of forgiveness, and a pardon of forgiveness is kind of what people traditionally view as a pardon. Somebody has served their time after being convicted for a crime. Uh, they're out. They're suffering the collateral consequences of having that conviction on their record. And the pardon and forgiveness uh, more or less is an act of mercy, uh, forgiving the person for past crimes and eliminating uh, collateral consequences in the future. Uh, for example, uh, someone could apply for a firearm permit who otherwise would have been barred from a firearms permit as a result of the, um, of, of the prior conviction. Uh, so, so that's the third type of four different types of, uh, of clemency uh, that the governor has the power um, to uh, execute or grant. And, and the last is something that, 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 that I've never seen uh, here in North Carolina, really anywhere, is the ability to grant reprieves. Um, a reprieve from a person's sentence is uh, the person's sentence is temporarily suspended for a period of time, um, so they don't have to serve the sentence until a later date. And so, so it's a reprieve. It's a period of time where the sentence is not um, active. And the governor could, uh, you know, conceivably grant to reprieve. And when I say the power to do um, the the power to uh, grant clemency is absolute for the governor. Uh, I also want people to be mindful, and, and I'm mindful here, and I hope the governor thinks about these things, uh, that clemency can be used in a creative way by the governor. I mean, if a governor is concerned about the potential implications of releasing someone uh, because they're not, certain, they're not certain or fully convinced that the person uh, has changed and is rehabilitated, um, a, a reprieve may be a possibility. Uh, so, so, so just temporarily, um, pausing the sentence and allowing the person to be free of the consequences of that sentence uh, while determining whether or not the person is fully rehabilitated. If they do great during that period of time, it could then be followed up with a commutation reducing the sentence um, after the person has demonstrated um, their rehabilitation. Um, so given the governor, the nature of the governor's power, uh, I also you know, would encourage the governor to think creatively, and, and hopefully this visual uh, and the people uh, responsible are also encouraging the governor to think creatively about how he can use uh, his power um, to grant clemency. Uh, finally, a couple other things I just want to say, and then my time will be up. Um, when thinking about the governor um, using that power, uh, we have to be mindful that it's political, right? Um, the governor is a political actor. He wants to be reelected. He wants to potentially pursue uh, another office after his term in governor. So there's always a political consideration to uh, what the governor uh, does with regards to clemency. Uh, that's distinct from the court process. Uh, courts are trying to follow laws when people are prosecuting, right? Um, so the... Um, so, so the governor suffers directly the political consequences of his decisions. So we need to be mindful of ways to uh, call on the governor to execute the power uh, while also you know, highlighting all the benefits and goods that are coming from clemency. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think is important for people to keep in mind. Um, you know, the governor has been very cautious, but we have great reason to be optimistic, and here's why. Uh, the, the governor in his second term so far is granting 17 clemencies. Uh, that's far more than his predecessors. You have to go back um, to Governor Hunt in 2000, 
to, to, to find someone that's using clemency, um, you know, to the same degree that the governor, uh, Governor Cooper has uh, seemingly been willing to do during the course of his second term. He only granted five in his first term. Uh, that's again, it's political. He wanted to be reelected to that second term, I imagine. Um, but, but the governor, I'm optimistic because he's shown a real interest in you know, recognizing rehabilitation, taking interest in the population of people who are incarcerated, um, and ramping up uh, clemency in North Carolina in a way we haven't seen in more than two decades, which is a really promising and optimistic um, place to be. And I hope that the governor um, continues, uh, but part of the governor continuing um, in the trajectory that he's on is that you know the visual continues to pressure the governor, but also by rejoicing and recognizing um, the actions that the governor has taken to utilize um, his clemency power. And I think that's all I have to say right now. Um, oh, I was asked to say a few things about the, the um, challenges. Among the challenges are the governor's clemency office is really a black box. Once an application is submitted, and as I said, the application typically is the form of a letter requesting the commutation, perhaps certificates or other um, documentary evidence establishing that the person has changed or is rehabilitation or warrants or deserves the governor's grace. Um, and then couple that with letters and support. That's, that's, that, those are the key materials in any clemency uh, petition. And if anybody's interested, they can be sent to clemency at nc.gov. And that's how the process gets initiated, sending a request and materials to the clemency office, and they can be sent vis-a-vis uh, -vis email. The challenge is, though, is once it's initiated, you receive a letter saying they've received the request or the application for an act of clemency, and then it's more or less radio silence until the governor decides to act one way or another. You can call and follow up, and typically all you'll hear is uh, the application is still pending and and under consideration by the government. So that's the real uh, challenge is just being able to wait uh, when there is a black box system that you never learn anything about what's going on until it's finally the final decision is made one way or another. Um, but, but a couple more reasons to be optimistic and then I'll finish up. Uh, not only is Governor Cooper granting clemencies, but we're seeing it used more and more uh, throughout the country. Uh, Governor uh, Whitmer in Michigan uh, had several grants of clemency uh, over the holidays. Uh, and, and this is notable for the next uh, two speakers. Among those were two people who have always maintained their innocence, uh, had been previously represented uh, by the Michigan Innocence Project unsuccessfully, and now have since had their um, sentences and pardons recognized by the governor of Michigan, Governor Whitmer. Um, Governor Newsom in California, and uh, of course, Kate Brown in Oregon recently cleared Oregon's uh, entire death row, something that the visual has been calling on Governor Cooper to do here in North Carolina. Um, so Governor Cooper has demonstrated a willingness and desire to continue this path. There's momentum uh, throughout the country, and hopefully the visual uh, and all the attention that can be brought um, on the issue of mass incarceration here in North Carolina, um, all the wasted potential uh, behind prison walls uh, can continue that momentum and result in the governor uh, taking more action into the future. Thank you, Jamie. Um, that's so impactful. I don't even know how I follow that, but uh, I'll try. So I'm going to um, introduce some people who are going to speak of their experience um, of their personal uh, campaigns for release. And they're going to be three. The first person will be me. The second will be um, Hiba Elwad, and she'll be speaking on the James Richardson campaign. And then we will have Richard Taylor. So for me, I went in when I was 15 and I came out when I was 46. I was sentenced to two consecutive life terms and I wasn't even eligible for parole until 2031. Um, Governor Cooper had a committee put in place called the Juvenile Sentencing Review Board, which started to review cases 
um, from those of us who were sentenced under the age of 18. With the process that goes through, three of us were released March of this year. Uh, it goes through a rigorous process. They have to look at our record. They have to look at our home plan, what we have done to educate ourselves and all that. I tried various things in the past and I saw all these guys that kept getting released. And I was like, I've just felt like I was being overlooked. I wrote a thousand people and it fell on a thousand deaf ears until after about 25 years in when I was introduced to the council and other people um, through media and just through word of mouth. And they began to say, you know, I feel like you deserve a second chance. And they were like, you know, we, you did the work. We just got behind you. And they said, we didn't even know you existed until you reached out for us. So I encourage people that are incarcerated to reach out. You can either choose to do what goes on in there as far as um, just getting caught up in mess and not helping yourself or trying to educate yourself, or you can utilize that power that only you have within to try to reach out and gain momentum about your case. Education and experience are the things that carry you far in life. And unfortunately, like someone like me who had to spend 31 and a half years to educate themselves, but to also learn myself to know who I am. And eventually, you know, unfortunately, 31 and a half years later, the world got to see who I am. So I now sit and advocate for those that I left behind. I feel like Danielle, whereas I left a lot of people behind and it's not just the holidays that are sad. I suppose sometimes it's every day because that's the life that we led for so long. So I started um, Fenced In Fighting for Freedom Advocacy because it takes a voice. The same reason that they didn't realize that I existed, a lot of people don't realize the ones that I left behind existed. So now that I'm here, I have to be the voice for them. So with that being said, the next person um, on my list will be Miss um, Hiba Elawad. Thank you, April, for that introduction, and thank you for sharing your story. I'm definitely happy that you're home. Um, just want to say thank you to everyone that joined today, and we're really grateful for the opportunity to be in this space with some really amazing people to share um, details about our coalition and campaign to free James Richardson. Um, so just to kind of give some background to those that aren't familiar with the case, um, in 2009, James was wrongly arrested and accused of a double homicide that happened in downtown Greenville, North Carolina. Um, in 2011, he was wrongly convicted of the murders and sentenced to two life sentences without parole. Um, so James has now been incarcerated for over 13 and a half years for crimes that he didn't commit. Um, for two years before trial and then during trial, this was probably the most high profile case in Greenville um, and got some extensive media attention. Probably I mean, the story aired about 90 to 100 times in that two year period. And the majority of the community knew James was innocent because the facts of the case didn't add up. Um, they knew he wouldn't get a fair trial in Greenville um, and were really, really supportive of actually getting his case moved out of, um, out of that city. Um, bottom line, there was absolutely no evidence to, you know, to convict, no physical or eyewitness evidence to convict. Um, since 2011, James has been appealing his case without success. Um, and in 2021, um, after years of reinvestigation and a 250 page brief that was filed um, on his behalf, we decided that it was turn, you know, time to turn up the volume. It was really time to uplift his voice, share his story, and try to bring as much state and national attention to his case that we could. Um, the court filing, as I mentioned, is very extensive. Uh, most people are not going to read a 250 page brief. Um, but it was full of facts of his innocence um, and the police and prosecutorial misconduct that essentially resulted in his wrongful conviction. Um, so with that being said, we really needed to figure out an avenue and a way to push that information out to the public in a more digestible way. Um, and also considering the high profile nature of his case, we knew we were gonna need community support outside of the courtroom to really help impact what our legal team was doing in the courtroom. Um, so that was really kind of the start of the campaign and why we decided to put, put it together. Um, we officially kicked off our campaign in December of 2021 with three specific goals. Um, first and foremost is getting justice and freedom for James, right? Sharing his story um, to those that are unfamiliar with his case, uh, reminding those that knew about his case that kind of just 
forgot, right, out of sight, out of mind, um, that he was still incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. Um, second, we wanted to educate the community on the police and prosecutorial misconduct that was discovered in the reinvestigation. Um, ultimately, that's why we know, or we know that's why James was convicted. Um, and statistically, the majority of wrongful convictions are not accidents or mistakes. Um, they're usually a result of intentional misconduct from the state. So we felt it was only right for us to share that information, um, not only for James's benefit, but for others that have also been harmed by those state actors. Um, one important thing to note here is that in the last three years in Pitt County and Greenville, two individuals, Dante Sharp, which many of you know, um, and another individual by the name of Darren Carmen had their wrongful convictions overturned um, after collectively spending over three decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit. So um, they were also both prosecuted by the same district attorney that James was prosecuted by. And so there's clearly a pattern um, in that county. And we really felt like the world needed to know about it. Um, and lastly, the Pitt County, uh, Pitt County elected a new DA in 2018 that you know, ran on a very progressive platform and a promise to establish a wrongful conviction integrity unit, um, which would review close cases like James's case where the convicted individual was innocent um, or suffered a miscarriage of justice. And the current DA has done nothing to establish that unit. Um, and we felt like it was very important to educate the community and voters um, to know that he's not fulfilling his promises um, and really bring light to the fact that he has the power to give James the justice and freedom he deserves. Um, so in a nutshell, that's why the campaign was started. Uh, when we kicked off the campaign, we started really homegrown, you know, with family, friends, his legal team, of course, uh, members of the faith community and activists that were familiar with the type of work in the landscape in Greenville. Um, but we knew we had to find ways to build momentum on a state and national level. Uh, we've made some really good progress over the past year. Um, we've been able to get him featured on um, some highly listened to podcasts, the Wrongful Conviction podcast. We've had some investigative reporters um, publish you know, some really in-depth articles on the case and the wrongdoings and the misconduct, um, but there's always work to be done. Um, and so our team continues to build momentum for the case through that consistency, the consistency of the outreach, um, to other organizations, our you know, weekly or biweekly coalition meetings, the consistency in the events that we're participating in, um, and story sharing, right? Anytime you get an opportunity to talk about James and his story, you do it. Um, and aside from kind of like the, the, the larger pieces that are the backbone of our movement, you know, we're doing those daily things that are helping us gain support, social media posts, passing out flyers, sharing the petition. Um, those are the things that are really helping us gain organic um, and long-lasting long support. Um, for anyone that's looking to start a campaign for a loved one, you know, there are obviously obstacles and roadblocks, of course. Um, I think that's inevitable in any campaign, regardless of the cause. But I think the one thing to always be mindful of is campaigns take time to plan and build up and no two campaigns are ever going to be the same. Um, unfortunately, there's no cookie cutter blueprint to work off of. Um, but one thing that you know I highly, highly recommend is always continuing to be persistent and push even if things don't materialize overnight. Um, there's two important pieces of the work. There's the community action, the rallies, the meetings, the local and state events, the petition signatures, and then there's the networking um, where you really have to reach out to any individual, any organization that you can get information on to help expand your base um, and partner with more folks that can really help you meet your goal of getting your loved one you know, out and free. Um, that's really the ultimate goal and really what fuels us and our coalition to keep, you know, keep going. Um, I know my time is probably short now, I think I've run over, but just a couple of things that I'd like to share with you know anyone out there that's looking to start a campaign for their loved one um, is number one, I think April said this best, is you have to, add, you have to be their advocate on the outside. Um, talk to everyone that you possibly can and don't ask, don't be afraid to ask for help. There are really a lot of people out here that care and want to get involved, but they can't if they don't know that your person or your cause exists. Um, so make those phone calls, send those emails and find any opportunity to share um, you know, your loved one's story and name. Um, second would be research, research, research. One thing that's really helped us along our journey is keeping up with local and state news. 
um, via newspapers and social media. Both platforms are just perfect space to learn about what your elected officials are doing or not doing. Um, and it's really an opportunity to learn about the movers and the shakers in your community um, that might be supporting, you know, issues like yours. And so um, it, social media for us has been great in not just sharing, his, you know, James's story, but also meeting and connecting with people that are just as motivated and are really out there fighting the fight for their loved ones and even people that they don't know. So um, definitely, you know, try to tap into that community. Um, and lastly, and probably one of the most important things, I should have said that this up front, but if the individual you're campaigning for is represented by counsel, please, 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 please always make sure that you're collaborating with them. Um, there are sensitivities around strategies and timing of certain actions, and it's always important to keep them in the loop. Um, you don't want to jeopardize anything that's happening in the courtroom, um, which ultimately, you know, is the starting point for all of this work. So, you know, always, always let that be a collaborative relationship um, and don't, you know, just go rogue because that can, can be pretty dangerous. Um, and then, you know, again, lastly, just stay persistent. It, it can get tough. The roads can get muddy, but persistence is really key um, in, in, in the fight for transformative change. April, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. We thank you so much. We will now hear from Mr. Richard Taylor. Uh, yes, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure uh, to be on this, this call, and I thank everyone for their expertise. Um, I joined the James Richardson Coalition uh, sort of by happenstance. Uh, I, too, once was wrongly accused of something that I didn't commit, but fortunately for myself, uh, a week-long trial ended up in the truth coming out, and I was found not guilty of crimes that I could have spent the rest of my life in prison. And so one day I was out promoting my book and I met uh, James's mother, Mrs. Dorothy Richardson, and she saw the book and she she mentioned to me about her son who, you know, who was in jail for a crime he didn't commit. And so I gave her my business card and, you know, told her I do kind of advocate for uh, those who are incarcerated. And she called me about probably about two or three months later and told me about this Zoom call. And on that Zoom call, I met of course, Hibba, who started the coalition, but I also met some great people uh, like the late Anthony Spearman uh, and Don Cavallini of, of Greenville, Miss Lisa Spees of Virginia, Heather Rattelaid, uh, Daydon Wakari, so many people uh, on those calls, faith-based, community-based, and that gave me a desire to get involved because as, as April said and Hibba said, I had no idea of who James Richardson was. Uh, before meeting his mother. And so for me to come in at, at such a time about, you know, probably by a, a year into, excuse me, 12 years into his 13 year sentence, I realized, okay, well, this is something that needs to be to be heard. So it is at that point that we, I guess, started establishing those rallies and those events where, you know, once again, I, I was able to, to, to meet uh, all of, you know, certain advocates and certain organizations, but also begin to hear similar stories like James's, uh, you know, once again, and, and, and I continue to hear those stories like April's, like Anthony Willis's, like uh, Dante Sharp, and so many others uh, who were fortunate enough uh, to get that clemency, to get that release, that I realized that there are so many more people who are you know, suffering in that manner. And, you know, with, with James's situation, we did we did an event in town center there. And uh, once again, it, it the obstacle is about getting the exposure because to my surprise now from Goldsboro, which is about 45 minutes from Greenville, but to my surprise, uh, while we were out there in the town center, not a lot of people knew about the case. Now, some did, but then not as many as I would have liked to know about the case, but, that what motivated me to, you know, to 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 continue and, and not get discouraged us when people heard about that case, when people heard about the details, we when we handed them the pamphlet 
uh, everyone was on board with signing the position and, and, and asking what they could do to further help. So um, that, 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 that's a testament to uh, when people hear certain things uh, that, that are wrong, then people will be able to be, be willing to uh, come to that, that support. But once again, the, 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 uh, the obstacle is once again, getting that information out there. But um, I've, I, I've seen the success and I know, as uh, Hibba mentioned, that it's, it's not an overnight success. I think, you know, talking to Dante, I interviewed him on, on my show, and he said it was a, you know, 24-year process. But, you know, when, pe when people get out, such as April and Dante, people think it just happened overnight. But that's not, you know, that's that's not the reality of it. The reality is it takes a coalition. It takes a group. It takes people with influence and um, people, people with knowledge, people with expertise in these areas to get... Uh, people like Mr. Richardson out. And uh, lastly, you know, once again, what keeps me motivated on, on the, the the fact of, you know, getting clemency is I go to a prison in Carteret County. I'm, I'm also an ordained minister, but I go to a prison in Carteret County every first and third Sunday. And I minister uh, in, in, in biblical capacity to the inmates. But every night after the service, I meet a new gentleman and they're also talking about their their hope for clemency or parole. People who've been in 30 years, 31 years, um, people who have been suing us, uh, sentenced under that juvenile law. And, and they're coming to me, hopefully that that they will re be a benefit of that, that overturning where it, it has been deemed unconstitutional to sentence a juvenile uh, to to. Um, that amount of time, that 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 life sentence. So, but what I realized with talking to them, like if they don't tell me that they're in they, that they've been in prison for thirty years, if they don't tell me, you know, their crime that that that, that they committed for for being in a prison that long, I would never imagine because of their demeanor, because of their, I guess, remorse, or because of their 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 coming to terms with I did something. Now I'm hoping to get that parole. I'm hoping to get out and get a second chance at life. And, you know, seeing those guys who come to church, who, who pray, who really are, I, I can see a transformation in them that keeps me wanting to do more in any capacity that I can. So I'm, I'm even learning from them. Every time I go, they give me an organization. They tell me people who are fighting for them on their behalf, people who are working on the inside. So I'm, when I leave, I'm calling these people. And so that, that gives me motivated that, you know, from the inside, people are doing work as well, but they need voices and foot, foot men and women on the outside. So once again, I just, I'm, I'm just happy to be, a, you know, a part of this, but I also commend all of you you guys who've been doing this for years and uh you know to 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 helping people you know who who have who who have you know made transitions to earn their clemency earn their second chance at life so that's what's keeping me motivated right now i'm actually getting excited just you know with the opportunity to speak on this call but i definitely uh you know appreciate everyone for for sharing but also uh everyone for the work that they do thank y'all Mm, thank you so much, Richard. I would now like to open the floor for a few brief questions. April, um, Peter asked a question in the chat that I'll just quickly answer. Is there any civil recourse to sue a county who has or had a repeat offender in the DA's office? And the answer is no, uh, given it was a, a, a prosecutor uh, they have absolute immunity and there's no manner in which you can seek civil recourse against them or the county where they're employed. Okay. Next question. Hey everyone, um, I have a question. So I, I noticed that this um, panel is clemency and beyond and another tool that I know of to help get people out of incarceration um, is possibly is the motion for appropriate relief or also known as the MAR. So I'm wondering if anyone has any insights about, as you're thinking about uh, what tools to use, um, when to choose to go the clemency route over the MAR route, or should you do both at the same time? Just any insights you have about using those tools? Well, an MAR should be used, in my opinion, before clemency because it has to do with the court system and the governor can utilize his executive power. 
once you're denied for clemency, if by chance you are, you can reapply within three years. MARs, to my knowledge, you can only apply once for that. Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, I mean, you, you can file more than a single MAR, but MARs are to correct uh, error at trial or when there's new evidence. Uh, you know, for example, an MAR may be filed on the basis of ineffective assistance of trial counsel, uh, a constitutional violation that was unknown to the defendant at trial, um, or because new evidence subsequently was discovered that bears on the question of guilt or innocence innocence decided by the jury at trial. Um, in the case of somebody who did in fact commit a crime, uh, the MAR wouldn't be an appropriate pathway uh, because there wouldn't be a basis to challenge the conviction itself. Uh, and clemency may be more appropriate to demonstrate or show um, the person's rehabilitation and worthiness of a second chance if the governor can be convinced. Um, so that, that would be kind of my Docs on the two pathways. Sometimes, for example, I, I know James Richardson has a pending motion for appropriate relief. Sometimes if you uh, try to convince a court of a person's innocence and that their trial was fundamentally unfair, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, courts are often difficult to convince that the criminal process in their courtroom uh, was flawed in some way, shape, or form after being denied uh, kind of on the legal grounds, then it's the uh, clemency pathway is another alternative um, after that denial. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, next question. No more questions? Okay. Um, Thank, every, thank you everyone for coming. And if you enjoyed watching this community conversation, I would like to encourage you to please visit um, it, uh, NC Justice Center on YouTube to uh, watch the other conversations from earlier this month. We also have visual notes available online at the start of, um, of the next year. It's not too late to join the Vigil for Freedom and Racial Justice visit www.decarceratenownc.com to learn more about the vigil and to sign our letter to Governor Roy Cooper. I would like to thank you all for joining us, whether it be virtually listening, however, just please join us on our fight. April, since, since we have a few minutes, uh, I just thought I'd add, um, clemency has a, beneficial impact for the state as well, in my view, that I think is important to the messaging. Uh, we all read on WRAL and in the local media about the difficulties staffing prisons, the difficulties of the mental health for the individuals responsible for uh, supervising and officers overseeing the incarcerated population. Uh, but Richard raised the powerful sort of impact of hope uh, when he was speaking. And when there is a meaningful opportunity to demonstrate your rehabilitation and earn and gain your release, uh, some of the conditions that uh, people responsible for uh, maintaining security within a prison uh, will be abated. Uh, people without hope do stupid things. People with hope try to strive to improve themselves and do better. Um, we need to uh, create a process, a system, a place of incarceration where everyone in the prison has the opportunity or has hope that there may be something better uh, that comes from that. And with that hope, we will see, um, you know, the, 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 the places of confinement transformed. And that would have a very a beneficial impact on a state that, you know, at any given time has 75% staffing, 25% vacancies because nobody wants the job of inhumanely treating people. Um, so, so this is not just important for the people who are incarcerated. This is an important issue for our state writ large and how our state and our criminal justice system is approaching incarceration, is, in pro is approaching prisons that are inhumane uh, in part because the people there uh, are devoid of hope and the people responsible for managing those people devoid of hope 
uh, themselves suffer the consequence of that. So I just wanted, with our additional time, to make my plug for why this is important for the state to do, even if you don't, you know, are a person who, uh, you know, sees mercy as an ultimate end goal, uh, there's huge kind of collateral benefits for the state and our criminal system uh, through giving people hope behind bars. Hope is a very important thing to have while you are behind bars, because like you said, people do stupid things. Um, I wouldn't sit, dare sit here and say that my record was 100% um, clear, but at some point I realized that the end goal was more important than what I was doing at the moment. Of course, you become angry, you lose hope, and you become frustrated because you want to get out, but you don't know where to look. And that's why everyone here is important and everyone within the sound of my voice, if you can reach out and help someone incarcerated or join those of us who do help the incarcerated, it's important for you to do so. And yeah, just one more thing I'd like to add to uh, why we have like a minute because um, that inmate, like, like I forgot to mention talking to James, you know, he actually, motivates me on the outside. He he gives me hope because he hasn't accepted that faith. He knows, you know, that he didn't do this. So he has people on the outside that are that are fighting on his behalf. So every time that I talk to him, he gives me much more encouragement that I try to give him uh, because, you know, he's 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 in a space where you know, he 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 understands that his fate is is out of his hands, but with faith and hope, he he can do it. And that's what I get from a lot of the inmates in there. They it's a motivational factor for me on the outside, knowing that you know I'm the only voice that somebody on the inside may have. And so I you know have a duty to to once again those I've I could have been you know spending the rest of my life in prison too, but I have a duty to those who who I was in there with that got convicted or you know are, are getting mistreated. Or, or under deplorable conditions that I know about, you know? And uh, once again, it's just a testament to, if you give that person a chance, you are a testament. Dante Sharp, Miss Metz, all of those are, all of you guys are a testament to if you give somebody a second chance, then, you know, they will be able to uh, continue on and once again, be, be a positive, uh, be a positive uh, example of what can be done you know, when, with advocacy and, and clemency and giving people a second chance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank everyone, all of you once again. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Take care, everyone.